Hello and a good morning to everyone. I am uh, Dr. Shishir Palsapuri and uh, today we have uh, Dr. Steve Johnson with us. And um, Dr. Johnson has doctorates in philosophy and evidence-based psychotherapy. And he's currently a professor of uh, graduate counseling and formed the MA in addictions counseling at Columbia International University, United States. In addition, and he runs weekly webinars on faith and mental health in international audience, as well as specialized training programs on uh, mental health addictions. And of course, uh, he is the president of Albert Ellis Institute, and he runs a certificate program in, um, at the Albert, Albert Ellis Institute in um, different, um, uh, I would say, um, in uh, different specializations like uh, workshops on diagnosing and treating trauma, um, then uh, REBT and uh, a lot of different subjects. So he has uh, quite a few publications uh, to his credit and um, he has lectured on various topics including uh, counseling, religion, REBT philosophy in over 300 universities in the United States, Middle East, Europe, Canada, and of course um, he has been to India for training psychologists. So I'm very, very privileged to have Dr. Johnson with us. And um, I am Dr. Shishir Palsapri. I'm also a psychotherapist and um, I am the founder of uh, Morphic Minds, um, an affiliated training center of Albert Ellis Institute, New York. So Dr. Johnson, uh, good morning and thank you very much for uh, being here. And uh, we are privileged to have you here for the discussion on addictions. Oh, thank you, Shashir. You know, I absolutely loved my time in India, and so it's really nice to get to talk to you, and we hope some Indians will be hearing this, okay? Of course, yes. All right, so uh, Dr. Johnson, I have a few questions about addictions uh, to you, and uh, please throw some light on these. What are actually addictions, and are these disorders? It's a good question, and uh, we don't have time to go into the whole history of that. But I, and I can't, I can only speak to the um, European and uh, uh, and American experience. For years and years and years, we thought that people thought that addictions was a moral failure, and often the treatment for addictions was punishment, uh, in the hope that that person would repent and develop moral character. Now we see um, addictions as a mental emotional disorder. Um, okay. And for that, that means there's a, for something to be called a mental or emotional disorder, it has to have a collection of symptoms that are clinically significant. That means it has to cause distress and impact our functioning, particularly our social, our uh, personal, um, interpersonal and then, of course, professional functioning. Right. To, to be called as a disorder, then um, apparently addictions do cause a lot of impairment in all these areas, right? So it's safe to call them disorders? Absolutely. Hmm. And, and what kind of addictions do we see in people? Um, in the DSM-5, you know, that we all use, or most of us use to, you know, um, categorize uh, disorders, addictions really kind of fall into two categories. There are those addictions that have to do with substance use and, um, you know, alcohol, benzos, um, caffeine, marijuana, hallucinogens, the opioids, cocaine, uh, even tobacco is listed in the DSM-5 as, as, as an addiction. And we look at substance intoxication, substance withdrawal and substance use disorder. So people can be in different phases of, phases of this. So uh, substance use disorder uh, is one. And again, there has to be like a pattern of use um, that uh, initially it is generally used, a substance is used to try to cope with the problem and maybe like coping with anxiety or, or depression. Um, and then uh, it ceases to be very valuable in terms of coping and becomes a problem in, an, in and of itself. And so, mm -hmm. so we see this pattern of use so that it becomes habitual and then it begins to really interfere in very significant ways in different parts of, the, in different parts of life. To the point, 
then it can cause major um, uh, danger, such as death, uh, incarceration, going to prison, or loss of relationships, jobs, all kinds of um, negative, negative consequences. And then the second category are what we call behavioral addictions. And then in the DSM-5, there's only one thing that's listed as a behavioral addiction, and that's gambling. However, those of us in the field often look at things like um, addictive eating, so that although it's not in the DSM-5, someone's eating pattern may be addictive in, in quality, or um, uh, pornography, sex, those kinds of would be would be behavioral um, behavioral addictions, and a lot of research is being done in those areas right now. So, um, so people start substance abuse or substance use for coping with an emotional problem or a practical problem to to deal with their emotional upset, and then it becomes a problem in itself later, right? That's right. You also mentioned about behavioral addictions, and uh, do you think like internet addiction and uh, phone usage is also one kind of behavioral addiction that? Um, you know, we see. Yeah, um, in the U.S. now, we are holding major training uh, webinars and, 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 and sessions, programs to help overcome gaming addiction because our young people, not just the young people, but even some of the older people um, seem to be kind of um, have addictive quality uh, about their um, use of uh, gaming. Um, hmm. And of course, then it inter that significantly can interfere in relationships. It just so happens that I was talking to a professor not at Rutgers University not too long ago about this. And I was saying, have you seen any differences in the person, in their presentation, their personality, the way they behave with gaming? He goes, you know, it begins when it gets kind of out of hand, the individual starts presenting as though they're autistic. You know, they've moved away from the satisfaction of relationship with another person, and then they're so into the into gaming. Mm -hmm. So even I mean, like gaming is a serious um, uh, thing that we see, especially in uh, adolescents in India. We we see a lot of gaming addiction, but uh, if not gaming, then at least uh, these children are addicted to screens. So is it is it okay or is it appropriate to call it a screen addiction or internet addiction? Well, it depends. There's how we generally talk about it in the field, and then there's the formal way to talk about it in DSM-5. DSM-5 is only counted one, gambling. I think so the DSM-5 has some right. catching up to do with the uh, with the culture, you know? So regardless whether it is in DSM or no, I know that it's it's greatly dysfunctional and a lot of children and especially young adults are uh, uh, abusing um, internet and screens to the extent that it is interfering with their functioning. So uh, I, I, I don't think that I'm going to wait till DSM includes it. In <laughs> it. <laughs> you might start treating it. <laughs> right. You know, is, is addictive behavior in, in somebody's control to begin with? Like, is it in fully, fully in your control to stop a behavior? Um, there, well, initially, when, we're, when someone's beginning the behavior, yes, they could have some, some control. The problem is, and, and I'm going to be talking particularly substance use disorder here, is um, that the... Uh, whereas initially the behavior may be under a control, as the addiction develops, there's less and less control over it. For example, with some of the drugs, a person is spending a good part of their time, their time during the day is just trying to get access to the, to the drug. And, um, and mm -hmm. so the world in some ways becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It's them and the drug. And so um, at that point, the person seems to have lost control o over the addiction and, and definitely needs some help. All right. So, you know, we, we can say that initially it is fully in your control and you may stop all, all by yourself. But later, you know, you may need some assistance to stop this behavior. Right. OK, so I, I have seen a lot of people who get into substance use or probably internet use or food 
uh, to cope with a problem and then the, the behavior itself becomes a problem. As you rightly mentioned, you know, about gaming, that there are certain type of people or personalities that are, um, that they become after addiction. But are there specific type of personalities who are more prone to addictions? Um, I don't know about actual personality types, but there are certain predisposing factors. Okay. And so we do know that individuals with a psychiatric history, um, you know, so for example, uh, an anxiety disorder. Let, let, let me just stop there with anxiety disorder, because anxiety, if we conceptualize that using rational emotive behavioral therapy, um, we, we, we say in general that every emotion has kind of a behavioral propensity with it, and the propensity, the behavioral propensity for anxiety is avoidance. And so if you think about it, gaming uh, is a, you know, is a, a very efficient way to avoid anxiety. It just is totally, it's really kind of an avoidance be, uh, uh, avoidance behavior. So an in individuals with the uh, psychiatric history, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, major depressive disorder uh, would be one. Also, the other thing would be those individuals who have adverse childhood events. You know, the ACEs score, high ACEs scores may be more um, prone to uh, addictions. In fact, the Kaiser Permanente studies have shown, uh, we, we can see that the higher the ACEs score is, the more likely that a person develops all kinds of mental and emotional disorders, including uh, addictions. So if there is a history of the of, uh, early childhood abuse or neglect, that would might have it be a propensity. There are some social factors that do that. One may uh, genetically have a predisposition toward um, frustration, et cetera, and so they might want to overcome that and, and uh, gravitate toward uh, an addiction. Um, major losses, trauma, trauma, uh, particularly if we look at like post-traumatic stress disorder, the two um, most common co-occurring disorders with PTSD are major depressive disorder, and then the other one is substance use disorder. So yeah, so we see that in, in trauma. And then age is a factor. Um, adolescence is a, is, has been traditionally a time when we see um, addiction go up, but the age at which it's starting is going down and going up. So, for example, um, kids are getting into addiction, drug addictions earlier, and then the um, elderly crowd, my age, right, the old people, um, because we may have chronic pain conditions, and many times we are prescribed, you know, the opiates, and so that can be a major addictive problem. So we see these different kinds of factors that may be just predisposing factors to developing um, an, an addiction. So it's interesting to know that there are so many factors that contribute to uh, a person who is addicted to either substance or a behavior. So, so it's not very uh, fair to blame the person only. And we need to look beyond the person who is doing that. And you know, uh, it starts right in the childhood. So does it also signal us that you know parenting rather be uh, done carefully? You know, you might be laying a foundation for addictions later in life, like trauma is your area of interest of research as well. So have you seen people, uh, I mean, like, of course, it's in the textbooks, but have you seen people uh, who have history of trauma also have a substance abuse uh, problem? It's, it's uh, absolutely huge. Um, oh. Absolutely huge. The percentage is overwhelming when, when we see major, major trauma. So we could, we could link it, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, so a lot of people do understand that they have a problem, like they are addicted to either a behavior or a substance or, or some kind of uh, a drug, and they want to get out of it. What can be done by such people who do have an insight and they want to do something about it? The good news is that we have better treatments now than we've ever had before, and so that there is, there is hope. I think culturally attitudes are shifting. There may be some cultures where people still blame the addict and say that they're weak or have weak character. 
I hope we've come out of those dark ages so that we realize that all of us struggle with something and some people struggle with um, with um, with uh, with addiction. So a good thing to do, you know, get help and take a look at whether there's any licensed mental health professionals in the area who actually use evidence-based treatments right. to, um, uh, you know, these treatments have been extensively studied and shown to be effective for helping a large number of individuals. Now, the treatment may differ for whatever the drug is or whatever. A lot of work is being done on the behavioral, um, uh, behavioral addictions. So we'll see what those treatments uh, are and what will be the best ones um, down the road. But right now, we know that for a good number of substance use disorders that cognitive therapies such as CBT, REBT, mm -hmm. um, mindfulness and mineralization treatments are, have a good outcomes. Relapse prevention therapy is another one. Um, motivational interviewing is, is, can be quite, quite good. Some people find help in 12-step um, mm -hmm. model. Um, my preference is to use, I mean, if you want to go to a meeting like a 12 step, might be to go to Smart Recovery because Smart Recovery uses the same ABC model that REBT uses. So it's not just going to be, and I don't mean just in a pejorative sense, so it's not just going to be telling your story, but it's going to be using techniques to help you deal with your cravings and to try to overcome the uh, uh, addiction. So, and then one that is quite good is called Seeking Safety for the Treatment of PTSD and Substance Use Disorders. So that was developed by Lisa Najavitz in Boston. Great. She, by the way, she chairs the uh, Division 12 of the um, uh, section on addictions and trauma in uh, for the American Psychological Association, and she's developed a treatment that has high, strong research support as being effective. It's quite good. It can be done with individuals in groups. It's got 25 lessons that you can do um, in any order whatsoever. It's like a menu. You choose the ones in the order that you want for the uh, clients that you have and um, really quite, quite effective. So you can see we have a lot of uh, treatments that are out there. So I'm really, really hopeful. This is, this is very hopeful. I mean, like, this is very interesting because uh, we see not just one treatment, uh, but there are a whole lot of treatments available for people who, who are struggling with addiction. So just because, you know, some treatment may ha not have worked with them does not mean that the next treatment is not going to work with it. You also gave me a very nice clue that um, not only the addiction needs to be treated, but the underlying problem also needs to be treated because, you know, sometimes these people may actually need help with trauma rather than the addiction itself. So, so we need to understand that it's a, it's a multifactorial thing and um, we need to look at different things and, and probably treat the whole person rather than just treating the addiction itself. Right. Absolutely. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of, lot of families, um, uh, the family gets disturbed if someone is facing an addiction, especially if, if we see the scene in India, uh, the major addiction that we, we have as a problem is alcohol. And we have seen families being completely uh, disturbed and, and I would say, not say devastated because using it, um, uh, but, but very disturbed and uh, kind of uh, uh, very affected by someone who is uh, going through alcohol um, abuse. So what can be done by families for uh, the people who are addicted, but they don't want to get out of addiction? Uh, and they don't want to get out of addiction. I they think there, there are a couple of things. Um, one, if you are struggling because a loved one, family member, whatever, whomever is, you know, in the active part of their addiction, that can be difficult. That can be quite challenging. And if you're having a mental, emotional issues around it, you might want to go and get therapy and some form of support to go through that because it can be quite a bit to uh, carry. In fact, the family might want to get go in and get some help. Uh, what you can do toward the person who is actively addicted, one is unconditionally accept them and not blame them um, and not try to induce guilt and go, you know, you've, you're causing all of these problems. 
problems because guilt won't work for an addict. But let, let's think about this. So um, the uh, let me give you what sometimes happens with addiction. An addict will say, I'm not going to use, I'm not going to use, I'm not going to use. They're, they mean it. They're not just making it up. And then they slip. And so then they start beating themselves up. They start feeling guilty. Well, guilt means you put yourself down, right? And that's a part of it, a major part of it. And so you're feeling really low and awful. And, and then the thought pops into your head, but there's one thing that always makes me feel better when I'm down. And that is, in that case, alcohol, right? So right. the induction of guilt having guilt is taking the very next step to use again. So that's not a great uh, strategy for family members to use. It's understandable, it's normal, it's just not helpful. The other thing is to have very clear boundaries um, to say, you know, beyond this, we will not tolerate it. You may decide if you do these things, we won't have you in the house because it won't be safe, right? Um, some people say if they, my child steals from me or my father steals from me, then I will not, you know, we will not tolerate that. They have to go, you know, somewhere else to get up. Every, I can't say what that boundary will be, but it's nice to have a clear boundary and take care of yourself that way. The other one is know the resources within the community because you're not meant to do this all alone and see if there's some really good resources that can help you, help you out, get emotional support for yourself. And then, um, some people go, they've watched TV and they go, well, well, could we do a family intervention, call the addict in, and then we tell them how awful this has been for us. Um, often that, you know, sometimes that's effective. I was talking to a leading scholar in the addiction field and he says about 9% of the time that will work. So that's not actually, you know, some, I mean, again, sometimes it works and I can understand a person says, I've tried about everything I can, why not do this? I understand that. Um, but um, there are some other things that you may be able to do and try to get yourself under control and not go, oh, is, this is it or nothing. You know, there's, um, you know, develop some, uh, one of your favorite words, grit, right? So it's understandable, you know, a lot of families in India, uh, we, we see that they, they are dependent on the person who is uh, probably the head of the family and they are struggling with addiction itself. So uh, for, for many people, especially Indian women, it might be really, really difficult to put their foot down and take a stand and say that, you know, I'm not going to tolerate and probably you will have to leave the house because probably, you know, um, they will have to leave the house. So, but putting, uh, uh, putting the foot down and showing a strong disapproval is probably going to be more effective than probably getting very angry or inducing guilt in the person. Yeah, and the anger and the guilt has more to say about your ability to handle frustration than it does the addict. And so uh, that would be something for the individual to um, the individual to to um, to work on. And I I don't need think we need to be demanding at. Uh, you know, et cetera, with an, an addict, be very firm and, and clear. But at least in REBT, the model that I use, I mean, um, we would say that what you do, you might want to think really what is in my long-term best interest and the long-term best interest of the individual in front of me. It may be that, you know, yelling and saying, get out is not in your long-term best interest if you're fully in you know, fully financially dependent on that individual. Maybe there are other things that you can do. And so that's why I would appeal to some of those external sources to see what, uh, what kinds of services are available. All right, so everyone who is watching this video, please comment here if you know someone who is struggling with an addiction. So type yes in the comment section and also share this video right away so that, uh, you know, it also shows on your news feed and it might probably reach the right person who, who is struggling with that. You know, or if you know someone uh, who, who is struggling with a family member or a close one who is struggling with addiction. So please uh, comment yes if you know someone who is um, struggling with addictions. So uh, as we saw that, you know, certain kinds of psychotherapies are effective in treating addictions. So is it also that certain kind of medications are found to be effective in, in treating addictions, right? 
often they're used hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. That they, let's say someone got into an addiction because they were self-medicating for, uh, to handle their anxiety. So um, it's in the old school way of approaching addictions, and, and there are still people that buy into this model, uh, but now the, many people think about it in a different way. They would say you have to treat the addiction first and then treat the other mental uh, emotional disorder that was underlying that. It tends not to be that the approach today, because let, let's take, for example, if we get the addiction under control, but the underlying anxiety is still there and that has not been treated, then there may be a high likelihood that the person gravitates back to the addiction because the anxiety is still there. The very thing that propelled them you know, into the addiction in the first place. So now we like to, many of us like to work on those simultaneously. Right, all right. One of your research areas is loneliness. Do you see a connection between people who are lonely and struggling with loneliness and um, any kind of behavioral or probably substance addiction? Um, wow, that's a whole different, um, different thing. And I would invite people to, you know, see one of the upcoming um, workshops that I'm doing on, um, on loneliness because I cover that just, that just that topic. But there is a connection. Oh, there's a connection. Yeah. So what we see in the movies, you know, um, a guy being dumped by a woman or, or a girl, you know, he is going through a heartbreak and then he starts uh, drinking. We have, a, we have quite a few movies made on um, those, that team. One of, them, one of them is Dave Das. So you know, if anyone, anyone um, um, has uh, had a breakup and they've started drinking, so in India, we call them Devdas. And the Devdas typically looks like this, who has a beard and, you know, <laughs> so I don't look drunk now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, we, that's, that's a very popular connection. Like so you're going through heartbreak and uh, you're drinking. So, you know, it's uh, interesting, Shashir. I'm mean, like, when we have these things, wouldn't it be nice if people gravitated to like a, um, a good habit rather than drinking? So oh, wow, my girlfriend left me. I think I'm going to go eat some carrots. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have people who go to the gym and, you know, there you go. <laughs> uh, they, they, we, we have lots of people who go to the gym and say that I'm going to show my girlfriend what she <laughs> lost. I think that's just a small percentage who, who go to the gym and, you know, try to buff up and then they show their girlfriends what they lost. All right. Okay. But, you know, we have lots of addictions, like um, in India, especially, we have women who are getting addicted more and more to substances. But uh, we see more and more adolescents getting addicted to behaviors, for instance, screen and uh, mobile usage. <laughs> and, and we have lots of psychologists in India who, who want credible training in uh, addictions counseling. So as you, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of resources for uh, for people who are addicted, who are dealing with addictions, like they could be going to psychotherapists, licensed therapists, especially uh, people, uh, the psychologists who do evidence-based therapy. They can also consult psychiatrists who would be giving them medication and they can go hand in hand. Are there any credible resources for uh, psychologists or mental health professionals who want certification in addiction counseling? It depends upon where you are in the world. Um, even in the United States, from state to state, the regulations differ. Um, and there's a difference between whether you already have your mental health license or you're just starting out and you're getting training to get a mental health license. If you already have one, um, you know, my recommendation is to, um, if you wanna specialize in it, you could always go back and get a degree or you could um, take a body of courses that would help you to be competent. So for example, courses in diagnosing uh, addictive disorders and the co-occurring disorders, right? Um, Evidence-based interventions for treating addictions like all those that I listed and, and more. How to do treatment planning specifically for addictions. Um, relapse prevention, which 
right. uh, it's tremendous in all disorders, but you know it's going to be big in addictions. And then psychopharmacology, you need a course in that. Um, that would be relevant to addictions. I would think that those would be the minimum. Now, if you, that's if you already have your degree and you don't want to go back and get another degree. Um, you know, don't be like me. So the, um, the other one is if you don't have the degree and you go, you know, I really know I want to uh, major in addiction counseling because like in the United States, this is going to be one of the, the most needed degrees we have because addictions are just growing so, so quickly, faster than we can generate uh, therapists and counselors to handle them. So I would recommend at least, um, there are some certificate programs. Uh, it depends upon your state, whether the, the certificate would um, permit you to do that. I'm biased toward getting as much, um, you know, m um, getting a degree in it that has an internship and uh, practicum um, and so that you not only get head knowledge, but you get some practical experience in working it, with it under someone who uh, is experienced um, supervisor. So maybe like an, a master's in an addiction uh, counseling program might be helpful. There are those that are residential. There are those that are online. Mm -hmm. But even the online ones, we're always going to have some kind of face-to-face -face right. practicum and internship. I don't know a way to get around that. And I wouldn't think highly of a program that didn't have that, that right. component. I just think that's uh, essential. So it kind of depends on whether you have the license or you getting the license. And then at what level do you want to, um, you know, do you want to work? Right. So currently, I think uh, in India, we, we do not see um, something as a super specialization in addictions counseling as of now. So I, I do not know of um, ME in counseling or addiction counseling. Um, but definitely, I mean, like if, if people are interested, uh, the psychologists who are watching this, if you are interested in an addictions training program, a skill development program or a MA in counseling um, in addictions. So please, uh, please comment uh, uh, interested here, please uh, inbox us. Uh, we'll be happy to help you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, it has been wonderful talking to you, but what do you see as the future of uh, addiction counseling? Where do you see it's gonna be five years from now? I think we're going to get more and more specialized and the treatment will be more individualized. We're doing a much better job. Um, and, you know, we were both participating in the Conf International Congress in REBT in Cluj, Romania, just this past October or so. And one of the movements that I'm liking in the field is that instead of treating a syndrome, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an alcohol, uh, an addict, someone who's addicted to al uh, alcohol, that we look at... Um, the components that make up the the symptoms that they have and we individually treat those symptoms rather than treat them just as a label and a, a category and so i think as we move away from syndromes to look at behaviors and symptoms and we develop interventions at that level that we're going to make some great strides so there are no addicts there are, there are individuals who need uh, individualized care right. i would and we're different. Everybody's different in the way that that gets expressed. And, you know, and, and I don't know about you, but I, my clients, when they come in, don't want to be treated as a label. They want me to see their uniqueness and then work with them at the level of, of, uh, of, of symptom. And that's, you know, kind of what I'm dedicated to, to do. Right. I have also personally seen people uh, who, who come to me who have been referred to me because of uh, severe problems with alcohol. And uh, the moment I start talking to them as a human rather than talking about their addiction, um, we are able to establish a very strong alliance, working alliance, and that probably gets them back to treatment, that gets them engaged in treatment. So looking at everyone as a human who, who has certain issues and we need to address those instead of you know, talking about addictions in the first session, I have done that. I have probably you know, done that in the third session, talking about their addiction, but like talking about their anxieties, their concern, their hurt, their anger, and um, that has almost always worked. 
So what's your, what's your ending uh, message to, uh, to people who are struggling with addictions and who want to give up? There's hope. I mean, there really is hope. And is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. But so many things in life that are worthwhile, like life itself, <laughs> is, is at times not not easy and there are people out there that care and go seek uh, some a professional who will you know treat you with the dignity the dignity that you deserve and will listen to what you have to say and adjust the therapy to fulfill what you actually need right thank you you were you were saying something and i cut you sorry i'm old shashir i can't remember what i was even saying so. <laughs> ADSD. I can't remember what I was going to say like five seconds back. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Steve Johnson. I have been always been privileged to have you in India. And I was fortunate to be with you at Kluge, the, the, the conference that you were speaking about. And I see a lot of hope when I visit these conferences because there's so much going on that we are not aware of. And if our psychologists are not aware of so many things going on. It's, it's common that, you know, a common man wouldn't be knowing what exactly is going on in terms of uh, helping them. So I say one um, thing to that, Shashir, sure. because I've been harping on this is I think a lot of people, the mental health field is very confusing for them. And so I think if they don't know where to start, my recommendation is if you want a model that's been kind of proven to be effective for a number of things over time, I'm very happy that in India, right there uh, in Mumbai, and you're in Nagpur, I think, um, yes. that um, we have, there are affiliate training centers of the Albert Ellis Institute, and we have training in addictions, you know, so that um, that might be a good starting point because one, if you go to a, um, an affiliate training center, I think you're like, you have one. And then you know that that individual just didn't get that degree, that they didn't just print it off the computer. You know, it takes years of preparation and training and people are, you know, looking very critically at how you're, how you're counseling. And so they can be more, they can rest assured that they're getting someone with a high level of training. Now, um, you know, nothing seems to, nothing works for everybody, but those evidence-based models are places to start, I think. That's, that's a very good encouragement, Steve. Not only we got trained, but uh, in fact, we have gotten so much of supervision that, you know, we know that we, we're not going to make this mistake, silly mistake again in counseling. So it's not just training, but the most benefit I have received is through supervision from people like you who have been you know, hammering us with basic concepts and constantly encouraged us to, to do better. So um, yeah, that's a good start. We have quite a few affiliated training centers of Albert Ellis Institute in India and abroad all over the world. We have lots of them. So that's a very good place to start. I can vouch on the training of Albert Ellis Institute. Um, we know what to do, what not to do. So um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Steve, for being with us and uh, guiding people with how to deal with addictions. And also, I look forward to a training workshop for psychologists in addictions counseling with you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Have a great day, Shashir. You do. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.